Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode in the series Dawa Ilallah. As we look at how we can be more effective in doing Dawa and calling specifically people to submit to the one true God. And one of the most important things that we can do as Da'is is find out what is permissible and what is not permissible when calling people to submit to Allah. And so we have now been looking at, at the last few episodes, at what methods can be used, what platforms can be used when calling or propagating the message of Islam, specifically calling people to submit to Allah. What can be used? And some of the ideas, some of the comments that were raised is that we can do one-on-one -on -one dawah. In other words, one person calling another person to submit to Allah. And this, is, we said, is one of the most effective ways. In general, it is a very effective, and frankly, it works better than many of the other systems that one might use in doing dawah. However, there are many, many different ways or platforms that can be used, but we find that this one is one of the most successful. This can be done in somebody's home, in the privacy of their own environment, so they don't feel threatened. So oftentimes when group dawah or open air dawah, colleges or school campuses or whatever are used, sometimes the person might feel threatened because he's not in a safe environment. So when you give them the option of being perhaps in their own home or outside in their own garden, they feel safer and they feel that you are not forcing Islam onto them or forcing the concept of Allah Ta'ala on them. So this is something that is quite good to do when doing one-on-one -on -one dawah. And we need to understand that we mustn't be afraid when we are calling people to submit to Allah. We should never be embarrassed about it. So even if you're invited to somebody's home and you can see that the people that you are going to be speaking to one-on-one -on -one are not people that have a very high opinion of religion. Maybe you see some of the, the pictures are inappropriate that are in the house or some of the materials that are lying around are inappropriate. Do not react. This is not your home. This is their home. It needs to be understood that they are not bound by the same Sharia as you and I are because they have not come to that knowledge as yet. So you mustn't pass judgment on the home that you're in and see something oh, haram haram and start telling them haram haram. They have no knowledge of anything at this point, let alone who their creator is. So your job is to go to their home without breaking the values that you have as a Muslim. However, you cannot pass judgment on certain things that they are doing. Perhaps they have a television set on while you are there. You have no right to tell them to switch their television set off. You are there as a guest. This may be customary and tradition for them to do every day. Your job is simply to give them the message of Islam should they have invited you to do so. So be very, very cautious that you do not project your own value system that you are bound by onto those people. They have not yet committed to Allah. So a very, very easy way to do it is when you are invited to go to somebody's house, perhaps you're invited by one of your employees or one of your friends to come to have a meal, more than likely they will have asked you, do you have any health requirements? Is there anything that you do not eat? Normally we do this even with our friends who are Muslims. We ask a Muslim brother, is there anything that you would like to eat when you come to my house? Is there anything that you don't eat? So we really do this. So it's more than likely that they would do exactly the same thing when you visit their homes. So you could state that, well, yes, in my customs and my traditions and in my culture, we, we don't eat this, but I'm very, don't force it on them. In fact, one of the easiest ways to deal with health issues and health requirements is to say we actually prefer more, we eat more vegetables in our home and we live a vegetarian type of diet. That, that plays it safe for you. So you don't have to worry about them. Even if they say, well, the meat is not halal or is halal, you don't know for sure that it is. So probably play it safe and have something that's 
doesn't have any meat or wine or something like that in it. So it's important that when we're doing one-on-one -on -one dawah, that we use a great deal of wisdom. When we are doing one-to-group dawah, this is also something that is useful. Say, for example, here in the studio, there's one person speaking to a number of people. Perhaps if you're doing a university or a school lecture, in the same way, you would have one person speaking to many. You need to make sure that you are addressing the vast majority of the audience. You're not just zoning in on one person or the other. It's very easy to put your focus just on the front row or the first two or three rows, and you forget about all the people in the back row. Make sure that you address all the people everywhere and make sure that you work as a group. If you're doing one on many dawah, make sure that you work as a group. Even though you may have only one speaker, try to position one or two of your fellow Muslims that have come with you in the audience. In a way, they can also help to explain certain concepts that perhaps the lecturer or the teacher has gone over and forgotten to explain properly. So if they're sitting in that row, they can say, he meant this, that means that. Because sometimes, even to the best of our ability, when we're calling and doing dawah ilala, sometimes we slip up and we use Islamic terminology. So you would have specifically placed people in that group that would be able to turn over to somebody, perhaps one or two people, not everybody, but one or two people and say, that means this or that means that. Or even to signal to the speaker by a prearranged set of codes that you need to go back a line and explain. So one of the people that would be sitting in the audience would maybe just go put up their one finger. That would mean that I need to go back one line and explain and go, oh, yeah, I forgot. By the way, this is what dawah means, or this is what salah means. So these are something that is very, very important when talking to more than one. Have a team with you. As we spoke about in the series, that you need to work as a team. We're not working solo. We're not working by ourselves. We're working as a collective body for the same purpose, and that is calling towards the submission towards Allah. So whatever system that you choose to use in your dawah, whether it be one-on-one -on -one dawah, whether it be group dawah, it is important that we, that we use a method that will be easy for the people to accept and understand. Now, when we give speeches, talks, and discussions, it should be in a way that people are able to understand and accept easily. I remember when I first started to do lectures and talks publicly, most of the people that came to the talk said it was interesting, it was exciting, but I didn't understand most of it. And then I realized that I had failed in my lecture. I was failing in the talk. If they said it was interesting, it was exciting, but I didn't understand most of it, it means that I'm talking way above the group that I'm talking to, that I'm not connecting with the audience. I am trying to show how intelligent or sophisticated or knowledgeable I am. And all I am doing is blowing my own trumpet, showing everybody how great and how intellectual I am. And therefore, I have lost the entire audience. So when I heard that, when somebody eventually told me, I suddenly realized I needed to tone the whole thing down, bring everything down a thousand notches, because we need to go to the very basic level when talking to people, especially about concept of Allah. And then we can raise the bar slowly until we get to a happy medium. So we want to make sure that when we do speeches or talks or lectures as da'is, that it should be to an audience who will understand it, and that is capable of understanding what we are talking about. Make sure that you use PowerPoint presentations when you're doing lectures or slides or a video, or whatever technology you want to use. Maybe you're going to be using graphs or charts or photographs or film clips or whatever it might be. That is what needs to be presented for the people to see whenever you're doing public lectures. If you're going to be giving a dawa talk or a dawa lecture and you have chosen to do this at a public platform, please make sure that you have enough books and a DVD or CD of your previous talk on the same topic available for people to take away. So don't do this talk and then have nothing for them to, or have a DVD relating to another topic that you did somewhere else that is not the same as the topic you're talking about. 
It needs to be the same DVD on the same topic that you gave to a different crowd. Whatever if somebody did form this lecture or talk that you gave, that must be presented at the next one. So it must be relevant and up to date. So don't use a set on talk that you did on how to come to Islam and Dawah ilallah that you did in 1924. It's outdated, it's all granular, the quality is not as good. The technology is moving all the time so that the video quality is better. So use the most up-to-date version of your lecture. Don't use outdated one. Use what is new, use what is relevant for today when you're working with the community that you are talking to. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, debate, debate. Rebuttal, 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 conclusion, conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Saturday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. UK on Peace TV. Courage it takes to stand up for what you believe in. Courage it takes to be true and righteous. Courage it takes to dare and answer your questions, be they social, political, economic, educational, or religious, to get clear and convincing answers. Test your courage and question me in there to ask. Dare to Ask, next on Peace TV. Use as many objects as possible in portraying what you're going to be talking about. One of the displays that often I put when I'm doing a lecture, and because we are doing television, I always try to keep something on the table. Because when I talk, people are continuously wondering what it is that thing on the table is for. Why has he got it there? And so even though they're listening to your topic, they're continuously curious about what it is. What is going to happen with that thing? So sometimes I will take a jug and fill it with blue water. Nothing that's normal. Some other color, green, blue, yellow. So they know it's not for drinking. Otherwise, they see a jug there, they know he's going to be using this for drinking water, and that's what it's for. And then I'll have a goblet, maybe a nice silver one or a gold one, something very extravagant. These two things are strange to have on the table. And then somewhere along the line, I'll use this as an object lesson, like maybe pouring water into the jug, into the goblet, and it overflows all over the place and starts running off the table and all the rest of it and then making some type of an object lesson with it. So it creates controversy, it creates memory, it creates something that they're going to keep in their head. It's, it gives drama to what you're saying. So when you're doing a public lecture, it doesn't matter what the public lecture is, create some type of memorable drama that they're going to remember, an object lesson, what I call an object lesson. Never don't have an object lesson. So whether it be a science experiment that you're going to do, or whether it's going to be some comedy, or whether it's going to be something strange, something that needs to be memorable about your lecture. People only are going to remember about 10 to 15% of what you spoke about anyway. So you want them, the object lesson, to sum up everything that you spoke about. So if you're talking about Allah, have an object lesson that they're going to remember that talks about how Allah is unique and different, and nothing is like Allah. So remember this for future, whenever you do a talk, even if it's not dawah related and you're not calling people to Islam, even if you're doing a public lecture or a talk or anything it might be, even at school, you're doing a presentation, you're asked to stand in front of your classmates and do a talk. Every year you have to do one maybe for English as an assignment. Have an object that you will leave there. The class will wonder what it is. And then at the end you type your whole lecture by having something that relates to that and you'll land up getting better marks. So that's just a skill that you can use when doing public lectures. It's just an object lesson.
Also, when you're giving talks or presentations on who Allah is, try to also bring in other information regarding misconceptions on who Allah is. So when you do public lectures, very, very important that you do a good and sound job of it. Another interesting thing is when you bring out, when you're doing public lectures, this is also a time that you can launch your books and any magazines, what we spoke about how to use Dawa through magazines, books, publications. At an event like this would be a perfect time for launching those publications. People have come to learn about who Allah is. Now they can be introduced to some of your literature. Now there are differences of opinion from different groups on whether you should sell this literature or whether you should give it away for free. It is that my policy and only my policy, I don't sell any literature. So I don't sell CDs, books, DVDs, anything. I just give those away. However, there are certain books that aren't related to Dawa Ilallah, like maybe they're a book on comparative religion or a book on reverts, reverts to Islam. Sometimes those books I will use and sell those because those will raise funds to print further books. But generally relating the rule for me, and I'm not making this rule for anybody else or any organization, but for myself, because Islam was given to me for free and nobody charged me to become a Muslim, and all the literature and all the books and all the information was given to me for free. And all the DVDs were given to me for free when I came into Islam or was interested in Islam. I have followed that same policy forward in the last 11 years. So for me, if you're not a Muslim and you want to know about Islam, everything is for free. Nothing is for sale. If you're a Muslim, that's different. Then you can buy it because that will support the work. I'll still be able to give out free literature to non-Muslims. So perhaps keep that in the back of your mind. Perhaps if you are going to be doing a Dawa event, don't have things for sale. This is not the time to raise money. This is the time for calling people to submit to Allah. It gives a very, very bad impression of what you are. Because people will listen to your talk and they say, what a fantastic lecture. What a fantastic talk. And they walk out and there you've got salesmen selling stuff. And then they go, oh, he's one of those. He's one of those people trying to make money out of religion. And this is the taste that is left in people's mouths. This is the impression they get. So preferably, if it is at all possible, try not to sell Dawa literature when you're doing a Dawa event calling people to submit to Allah. Now, books and journals are very, very important. But these books that you use, we've spoken about before, have to be specific. They have to be books that are specific to Dawa Ilallah. Same with DVDs, same with CDs, same if you're using cassettes or whatever before, because some countries still use audio cassettes. They don't have DVDs, they don't use CDs. And the other thing to remember is that when you're using things like television, radio, and the internet, be very, very cautious of what content you're putting on, because the whole world can be listening in. And remember that if you put it on the internet, on the internet, it's there for life. On TV, it's not there for life. On radio, it's not there for life. On the internet, it's there for life. The history remains. Even your website that you created in 1995, it's still available. Even though you haven't paid for it, you haven't looked after it, it still can be retrieved. It's still there in the archives. Be careful what you say on the internet, it will come back, if, unless you want it to come back case it's something maybe you said that you wouldn't want to say. Now, it's very, very important when we are doing Dawah that we understand that there are many different styles and many different ways of doing Dawah. There's not just one way of doing Dawah, as we'll see as we go through this series, inshallah. But there is body language, as I said before, is extremely important to read. When people start getting bored, what do we do? We stop talking. When people start fidgeting, it means your message is not getting through. No matter how well you've prepared your topic, and I find this 90% of the time happening with me, maybe it's just me, maybe other scholars experience the same thing, maybe other comparative lecturers experience the same thing, maybe other dais, I've never asked them. But what happens with me is I can prepare the greatest lecture, but what generally happens is only 20% of that lecture actually ever gets used. The other 80% comes from the situation. You are busy presenting your talk, 
and then into your talk you see that it's not connecting. Your great ideas, your fantastic presentation just went out the window because you have to change it midstream. Because if you are reading your audience correctly and you are learning the techniques of body language and reading body language, seeing their smirks, seeing the way their eyes are looking, seeing the way they are fidgeting, see the way they are sitting, everything is telling you about their attitude to what you are saying. So if you see someone sitting there like this and they're going, then you know they don't believe anything you're saying. If they're sitting there and they're going, then you know they're getting through. This guy, he gets it. You want everyone to sit like that. Body language is everything in your talk, in your lecture, in your presentation of Dawah Ilallah. You have to be a mastermind. You have to be an investigator when you are doing lectures and talks. So body language is the technique or the process of understanding what a person is saying without saying anything. So it is the only technique that I promote in Dawah Ilallah. I don't have any other techniques. I don't say, you know, all these different things that people often use as techniques for Dawah. The only technique is I say that you must learn how to read body language. There are online courses you can do. Some of them are free. Some of them you have to pay for. There are courses that you can get in your local communities. But again, be careful. There's a lot of quacks out there. There are a lot of people that use body language techniques, but they've got spiritualistic connections to it. So it's a way like Zen Buddhism or something like that, connected to religion. You're not wanting to do a body language course connected to religious beliefs. It's only the science of body language. So you're not going to, there's body talk, which has got nothing to do with body language. So be careful of these things. Don't, just because it says you want to know how to read body language doesn't mean it's a body language course. So be very, very cautious. It will help you so much to connect with people if you understand how to read body language. It makes your dawah jump up 10 other levels from the average person because you're able to read exactly what they are thinking before they even say anything. So you can be speaking to someone and say, I know you don't agree with this. They haven't even said anything. I've done this in many universities. Well, I'll be talking and I'll say something and I see people are getting it and other people don't and I'll look at that specific person to this person and I'll point and I'll say, but I know you don't agree with that. And then afterwards he comes to me and he says, how did you know? And so you need to be able to connect with people, to be able to read the body language of the people in the audience to be more effective. So this is something that I think is very, very, very important. And there needs to be a series specifically tailor-made for how to read body language and how to connect with people. We do public speaking skills. We do how to do PowerPoint presentations. We do all these things, but in Islam, no one's really connected to the fact that this is an important issue. And it's been used by all the important departments within government, whether they be crime, whether they be law enforcement, whether they be FBI, CIA, intelligence services, everybody's using it and taking it very, very, very seriously. And yet we have only just caught on to the fact how important it is. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. So make sure you read the body language, <laughs> which is I want to see you again. So join us again, same place, same time next week. So from me, Arubi Islam and those in the audience, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.